Hi guys, I hope you're doing well. I wanted to share some things that I was learning this afternoon. I had a couple hours to read a really good book um, called The Questions Christians Hope No One Will Ask by Mark Middleberg. And the reason I'm reading it, I was looking for answers for the question of if God is good and all-powerful, why is there evil in the world? Um, this question was was brought to me on the sidewalk at Planned Parenthood. I was talking to a couple ladies there and they'd both been through a lot of suffering in their lives. They'd seen a lot of family and friends that had been through a lot of suffering and um, one of the ladies in particular was really searching for an answer to that question and I didn't really know how to respond to it. I, I basically just talked about original sin and um, that Adam and Eve brought, you know, the, the devastation and the destruction that we have in our world but that God is still good and still loving and faithful and kind and that he is the hope that we have. And I just wanted to know better how to answer that question because I felt like, I mean, I still don't really even understand it that well. But there are a lot of really good points in this book and I was going to write a blog post, but I just don't have time. I'm a slow typer and so I thought just talking it out would be quicker and it's also better for me to help process. So um, I'll just share a couple points from this book. I hope it's helpful to you. Um, Mark said that this question is the number one question that non-believers will ask believers. And so I think if you haven't encountered this question already, you probably will at some point. So I just wanted to share what I've learned and hopefully, hopefully you can learn some things from it too. So um, first of all, he said, the best thing you can do when someone asks this question is to ask questions, ask what they've been through. Um, sympathize with them, give them compassion. He said a lot of times people that ask this question are searching for love and sympathy. They they know that you know the Lord and they want to know that God is loving and that, and that God is good. And so it's almost better to um, just show them the love of Christ by your actions and by your listening ear. Um, but he said if there are, are um, times that you can give more of a philosoph uh, philosophical um, conversation, uh, then these are some points that you can make. So I'll just quickly read through them. I, I was scribbling down tons of notes in my notebook. I'll just read through kind of the big things that stuck out to me. So there are seven points that you can make. The first one is, the world is as Jesus predicted. So convey this thought. Though the problem of pain and suffering does present challenges to the Christian faith, it's worth pointing out that these problems reflect exactly the kind of world Jesus told us we would live in. He said in John 16:33, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So suffering and trials and pain, it's not a surprise to Jesus. He's predicted it, he knows, and... And he has promised that he will overcome all of it. Second point is, evil was not created or caused by God. God did not create evil, but he did create human beings who could truly love and follow him. Inherent in being truly human and able to truly love is the ability to go the other way, to not love or follow God. That was the choice Adam and Eve made, and that choice has been repeated down through the human race to you and me. The ability to love always entails the ability to not love. If we didn't have this choice, we would be robots or puppets, and our love would not be real love, because real love is always, by definition, freely chosen. So to bring it back, God did not create evil, but he did create us as free beings, and thus he created the, pot the potential for evil. Number three is, the cause behind most suffering is human. A commonly estimated figure is that as much as 90% of the suffering in the world comes through human causes, through wars, genocide, human trafficking, murders, torture, racial discrimination, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, rape. God didn't want any of this, and he warns us against it in his word, primarily the Ten Commandments. He gave us so much guidance in his word of how we should live and guidance on protecting the human rights of other people and loving other people above ourselves. Um, but it still doesn't stop most of the suffering that is caused by the evil and the sin of human beings. 90% of the suffering in the world is caused by humans. Um, 
one point that he made that I thought was interesting, I wrote it down, he said, interestingly, some people hear these kinds of statistics and say that God ought to just put his foot down and stop all the madness. When I hear someone say this, I like to ask them which freedoms they think God ought to take away from us right now. Stopping all the evil in this fallen, sinful world would entail taking away our human liberty as well as stopping all of us in our tracks. The line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man. There is not one good. No, not one. So in order for God to stop all the evil, he'd have to stop all of us. <laughs> and, and like, what evil would he stop? I mean, we're all evil. We all do evil, sinful things and all have evil, sinful thoughts. And so the only way around this, if God was to stop all of the evil, was to stop all of us, to exterminate all of us, or to program us to not choose evil. And then we'd be robots. And God didn't want us to be like that. He wanted us to be free. Um, number four, we live in a fallen world. A byproduct of the moral evil that has infected the human race is the natural evil that has affected the world around us. That is, when Adam and Eve sinned, the results were cataclysmic, affecting the way the world works, bringing in death and decay throughout the world from many sources, including hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, floods, fires, and other natural disasters. It's a part of, part of the world, part of sin is that it's affected our world so drastically and it's brought in all the natural suffering that we experience here on earth. He also makes a point, we should recognize this natural evil and its roots in the moral failure of humankind, but without ascribing each incident of suffering to a specific sin or action. So we should never say like, oh, this is happening to you because of this, because you sinned or because, because you did something wrong. Um, that's not the case. Because we live in a fallen world that is not as God intended it to be, things will go wrong and people will be hurt, as Jesus predicted. God can and sometimes does protect his people, but for reasons only he understands. He sometimes allows bad things to happen to his people. Number five, God will finally judge evil. So it's not like he's just taking away his, his hand of of power and allowing evil to just run rampant without any consequences or any judgment, he will one day judge each of us for the sins and the evil and the wrongdoing that we do. Um, I'll just read. He says, God promises he will vanquish and judge evil, but simply hasn't done so yet. God's justice and the final day of judgment and reckoning for each of us according to our sins is a well-established biblical reality. But mercifully, the Bible also reveals a God who is patient. God said to Moses, I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But I do not excuse the guilty. Why is God slow in anger? 1 Peter 3.9 explains, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. That is why evil still exists and why all of us still exist. That's why God hasn't wiped out each of us, because he's patient with us. He wants to see all of us come to a saving faith in him and come to repentance. And that's evidence of his love and his mercy and his goodness that we are all still here. And even that evil still exists because God is patient and we know that he is just. He hates the evil and the wrongdoing and, and the horrible things that are happening in our world. But he loves the world so much that he holds back his wrath and his judgment and his justice that he will one day unleash. Um, but he holds it back for now because he wants to see us come to saving faith in him. So another point, number six, God suffered too. And I just love this point. Um, brings me so much peace and comfort. Uh, he says, it's important to remember and to remind our friends that the God who allows us to suffer for a season in this fallen world also came to this world and experienced suffering in ways none of us ever will. He suffered the abuse and death of a criminal on the cross so that through him we could one day be set free and released from suffering in heaven one day where there is no pain, tears, or sorrow. That is the hope we cling to now, that 
God walks with us through our suffering in an understanding way. He knows exactly what it's like to go through abuse and abandonment and neglect and physical pain and suffering. He knows and he gives us compassion and comfort that can only come from a place of understanding like that. Um, one thing that has really stuck with me through the years, I had a conversation with the pastor on the sidewalk at Planned Parenthood. I think it was the first year I led 40 days. Um, we had just talked to a man that came out that told us about his former abortion, and it was like 40 years ago when he had this, but um, he was still just really struggling with it, and we just basically, we just listened and expressed sympathy and compassion, and Pastor Bill was able to pray with him very briefly. But we were talking about it afterwards and talking about some things that we could have said if we had more time. The man had to leave pretty quickly. Um, one of the things that Pastor Bill said was, God knows exactly what it feels like to put a child to death. He knows exactly the pain, the heartache, the heartbreak, the suffering that something like that causes. And yet he did that because he wanted to set you free from the pain of abortion and from the sin of abortion. He did that so that his son, the blood of his son, could pay the penalty for that and set you free and give you forgiveness and healing and redemption in Christ. He did that because he loves you and he doesn't want you to be stuck in that pain anymore. Um, that just really struck home to me. That's something that's really impacted me and I'm just I'm so thankful that Jesus did die um, so that we could be set free. Whoever the Son sets free shall be free indeed and I'm so thankful that God does promise to put us back together emotionally too. Um, he, he promises that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So he who began that good work of, of forgiveness and repentance in you um, will continue to heal you and restore you and, and bring you to completeness and perfection in Christ. So that is the hope that we cling to now in the midst of suffering, that God knows exactly what we're dealing with, exactly how we're feeling. He walks with us in those really difficult times. And because of the death of his son, and if we believe in him, we will no longer suffer in heaven. There is that day coming that we can cling to. We can cling to that hope. Um, so the last point, number seven, God can bring good from bad. We have hope that God is always at work in our lives as followers of Jesus, taking the real things in our lives that are bad and bringing good out of their wake. Um, Romans eight twenty eight. 28, um, how does it go? And God causes all things to work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Um, God, God promises that if we are... If we are followers of Christ, he will cause good things to come out of really bad things. A um, couple things that Mark listed. He can use pain to deepen our character. And one of my favorite passages he listed, Romans 5, 3-4. through four. And not only this, but we rejoice in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given to us. So pain can deepen our character. Uh, secondly, he can use pain to reshape us as his sons and daughters. Uh, it can be a form of discipline for us, discipline that um, that works away in our sinful tendencies and makes us more and more like him and helps us walk in holiness and, and righteousness, and ultimately that will bring us the most joy when we walk in the path that he has for us. He can use pain to give us a more spiritual and eternal perspective, so I think it shakes our focus off of this world onto him more and onto just why we're here, that we're here for him and for his glory, not for ourselves. Um, he can use pain to grab our attention and teach or direct us in ways that will be important in our lives. He uh, wrote a quote from C.S. Lewis that says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God is willing to use pain if that's what it takes to arouse us and to lead us to him or lead us to the right path that he wants us to walk in. And lastly, he can use pain to lead us to himself. P 
pain through sickness, perhaps cancer, or pain through lose, losing a loved one, can lead us in search for love and comfort. And God is our comfort. He says in Psalm 34, 18, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So ultimately, the cross is what gives meaning to our suffering because it tells us we do not need to suffer on our own. Jesus suffers with us and suffered for us. Jesus does not desire that any should perish, but that all should come to faith in him. That's why he patiently endures our evil and our wrongdoing and our sin, because he he wants to give us forgiveness, and he wants us to come to him in repentance. He is a God that's slow to anger and abounding in love and kindness and compassion and mercy and grace. And it's really just an act of his mercy that evil is still here on this earth, that he doesn't just wipe all of us out. He doesn't just stamp out our lives because of the evil that is a part of every one of us. Um, it's a testament to his goodness and his mercy and his patience. Um, and he wants to give us full and lasting joy. That was just something that I just wrote down that I was thinking of. If pain causes us to run to him and to turn to him, that is the best thing we can ever do with our lives. Because we were made to love and worship God and when we do that that is when ultimate joy and satisfaction and peace is found and he wants us to come to that he wants us to experience the fullness of joy that is found only in him so I hope this is helpful I thought these points were really good and were very biblically sound so I wanted to share those things I hope it's helpful to you um, thank you all so much for participating in 40 Days for Life. I really appreciate all that you guys are doing, and I hope God will continue to bless you out there and, and bring people that we can talk to, that we can share these truths with. So keep up the great work. Thank you so much.